Hi class, this is Professor Harmony Kim who will teach Buddhism in East Asia in spring 2021. This is the first class. The first half of this class, we will go over the syllabus. The rest half of this class, I will introduce how Buddhism developed and declined in India so that Buddhism can transmit from India to East Asia. Let's look at the syllabus first. The course number of this course is BUD 305. It is a four credit course. This course introduced the diversity of Buddhist ideas and practices in East Asia. Exploring Buddhism as a living tradition, it focuses on the impact and interpretation of Buddhism in historical and contemporary cultures. After developing a background in basic Buddhist philosophy, we explore Buddhism's cultural impact in literature, art, ritual, ethics, economics, social interactions, and politics. Upon completing this course, each student will be able to understand the development and decline of Buddhism in India. Students will discuss the reasons to cause the translocation of Buddhism outside the Indian continent. Also, students will examine and compare the characteristics of Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. Students will understand the Silk Road as a vehicle to spread Buddhism in East Asia. Students will be able to discuss the different forms of Buddhism in East Asia. East Asia can be limited to Korea, China, and Japan. Instruction of this course will consist of lectures, reading assignment, class discussions, and handouts. This information is more based on classroom-based instruction. Now we are on the pandemic, so instructional delivery can be a little bit adjusted. Classroom questions and discussions are strongly encouraged. If you were in the classroom, other instructional techniques may also be employed, such as audio-visual presentations, guest speakers, critical thinking exercise, etc. You will have lecture video every week, and I'm thinking about maybe I'm going to load short lengths of a guest speaker, maybe down the load. Each class will have a lecture on the assigned chapters. Students are expected to read the material related to the class. So sometimes I upload a research paper. So you read that article so that you can easily understand the lecture. Also, I can put some exam question based on that research paper so that you can answer in the format of an essay. The instructor will demonstrate the problems and case studies in class. Students may work alone or in groups to do assigned problems in class. These two informations are more based on on-site classroom-based lecture format. So, in this online format, you will mainly listen to my lecture video and you will read some research article which I will upload and send it to you. The required textbook, I chose two textbooks. One is Conceiving the Indian Buddhist Patriarch in China. So this is Studies in East Asia Buddhism. 
Author is Stuart H. Young. The other textbook is The Silk Road Journey with Xuanzang, by written by Sally Harvey Riggins. Additional textbook could be Great Doubt, Great Enlightenment, The Tradition and Practice of Kan Hoa Son in Korean Buddhism, written by Hagok Sunim and other Korean monastics together. If I introduce myself, my name is Harmony Kim. So you can call me Dr. Kim, Professor Kim, or Professor Harmony. My email address is this. So you can use my Gmail, personal email. And whenever you send assignment or a quiz assignment weekly base, you have to send to this email address. If this class open in the classroom, the schedule of this class is Monday. So you have to submit assignment before Monday, such as the midnight of Sunday, just before Monday. Students must send the above email weekly base for your assignment. You need to write down the subject title of the email as week 1 assignment, week 2 quiz, and so forth. I will show what does this mean a little bit later. If you have any question in addition to the assignment, please send me email with the subject title additional question on the email. So mostly you will write down subject title with week one assignment, week two quiz, week three quiz, week four quiz, midterm answer, something like that. But in addition to assignment, if you have additional question, then you can write down additional question in subject title of email domain so that I can reply to you. Just in case if students keep asking the information which have been clearly addressed in the lecture video, I might now respond or delay replying. We are going over the syllabus. So if you listen to this lecture video, you can easily understand what you have to do. I already explained what you have to do, so please listen to lecture video. Then if you have any ambiguous part or if you have additional question, you can send me email at the time. Please put subject title with additional question. It is possible to reach me by email at any time and you will get response from me within 48 hours during weekdays. I reserve the right to change or modify any or entire syllabus and I will notify students of any change. attendance policy, which is important, please make every attempt to be in class during all sessions. Regular and punctual attendance, as well as active student participation, is an important part of a student's education. Attendance is strictly monitored. All missed assignment and or additional assignment must be completed according to professor's guideline. Students may not miss more than 70% of class sessions. Three consecutive absences require formal notice. UE West very strictly monitors students' attendance. So if you miss more than 70% of a class session, you'd better drop off this course. 
Also, you can have sense of three times of this course. But in case of three consecutive absence, it requires formal notice. You need to explain why you have two absence in three consecutive times. So keep in mind, how can I count your attendance, your assignment, your supposed submit, weekly based assignment? If I do not receive your assignment until Sunday midnight, it counts your absence. Some students submit the assignment after due date. It also counts absence. I do not accept late submission. So keep in mind not miss the due date of assignment. Participation policy. Each student is expected to be an active participant in submitting weekly based assignment to my email. Your class participation grade will reflect the quality and consistency of your contributions. Mere attendance does not represent participation. Frequent absences will severely impact your participation grade. As I told you just before, you suppose to submit email every week. When you send email, this is the example of email format. You have to send to my email address. Also, you must include your email address in CC. Keep this email until the end of this semester. Also, title of a subject, probably, this is the course number, Buddhism 305, week one assignment. In this week, the assignment is, you are sending email to me by writing your official name, last name, comma, first name. Then this is the assignment of this week, and once you send this email, I will count your presence, your attendance of this class. Next week, same format, send to my email, your email address written in CC, and subject will be Buddhism 305 week 2 assignment. This time, probably next week, I'm going to give a quiz. When you listen to my lecture video, you will hear about quiz question. Sometimes two questions, sometimes three questions. So once you solve a quiz, this is the answer. So you have to write down your name first. It must be official name. My name is official name, last name, followed by first name. Then you will write down the answer of quiz question. When you submit this email to me until the Sunday midnight, then I will count your attendance of week two. Academic integrity. Each student must do his her own work. Copying assignment will be considered cheating and then all parties will be penalized. Please do not wait until the last minute to do your assignment. Some students send me to excuse for their late submission of assignment. They say that, oh, something happened, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, I'm sending assignment Monday morning. Still late submission. So I will not accept late submission. So please do not wait until the last minute to do your assignment. I am giving one week to complete the assignment. One week, seven days is more than enough to complete the assignment. So please be diligent and don't be late to submit 
your assignment. I encourage students to discuss their classwork and assignment together. This is the story for on-site class format. You learn a lot from your peers since you go through the same learning process. However, after the discussion, each of you should work on your own assignment independently from scratch. One learns by doing, not by working together to print two copies. This is not learning. If any part of an assignment represents the world and ideas of others, you must cite those sources. Academic dishonesty includes, but is not limited to, asking a tutor or a friend to complete a portion of your assignment. Hiring a reviewer to make extensive revisions to your assignment. Submitting so work originally submitted by another student as your own. Using information from online resources without properly citing your source. Copying any portion of a word or idea from any other source you do not cite. You might have an essay question probably in the final examination. At the time you need to write down short essay. Maybe you can include some other person's saying some other person's word at the time, if you include citation, then you are okay. But if you copy any word from any other source you do not cite, then that will be problem. So this part is more like uh, when you have an essay question, okay, and then the above paragraph is related to on-site, the classroom-based, situation. Assignment or quiz will be announced through lecture video. So you must listen to lecture video so that you can hear about what could be announcement in this week. The due of each assignment is until Sunday midnight of the following week because this course is supposed to open on Monday. All assignment must be turned in on the due date by email. Again, no late submission will be accepted. When you send the assignment or a quiz weekly base, you must put your email on CC so that you can keep the copy of every email of submitting the assignment. So this semester consists of 10 weeks or 11 weeks. If we include labor holiday, it will be 11 weeks. So if you keep 10 times of email in relation to turning in the assignment, then sometimes you can show how many times you attend this class by counting the number of email which you submit to me. In the body of email, you need to write down your official name, last name, comma, first name, because many students use their email account quite different from official name. And when I give you final grade, I have to use your official name, not your nickname. So in the body of email, you have to, always you have to start with write down your official name. Write down last name, comma, followed by first name. Do not change the position of last and first name. Since there are many students register this course, some students' first name can be some other student's last name. So it is hard to find your name on the long list of a roster. Therefore, you must write down last name, comma, followed by first name. In the lecture final, you might have essay question. All essay assignment must be typed. 
So in this case, assignment can be lecture exam. How can I evaluate your performance? Homework assignment, mostly quiz, weekly quiz, will be 30%. Midterm, 30%. Lecture final, 40%. Midterm exam will be multiple choice question. Final exam is mixture of multiple choice and essay question. You can have either this A plus, A, A minus, so each group A, B, C, D, I can sub-categorize into three, A plus, A, A minus, B plus, B, B minus, this way. So you will get one out of this for your final grade. Let's look at the schedule. So this week, we are reviewing syllabus. And after syllabus, I uh, will briefly introduce the spread of Buddhism from India to East Asia. And next week, the second week, you will study Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism and what are the reasons to cause the decline of Buddhism in Indian subcontinent. Week 3, spreading Buddhism into East Asia via a Silk Road. So many merchants, they contribute to spread Buddhism from India to East Asia. Also, you will study Buddhism from India to East Asia in China, who will be Chinese pilgrim, also who will be Indian patriot to spread Buddhism to China. And week five, you will have a midterm. After midterm, you will study spreading Buddhism into Korea by this time maritime. So Buddhism can transmit from Silk Road through land. But there is another route to transmit Buddhism by sea. We call them maritime Buddhism. Also, you will compare Chinese meditation and Korean meditation. So, Korean meditation practice is called Gwanhaseon. Korean Gwanhaseon is an authenticity of Buddhist meditation. And you will have a labor holiday. After that, you will study Japanese Zen Buddhism, Satori, and then you will have a final examination. I told you that every week you're supposed to submit assignment. Again, you will send email every week. This is my email address. Include your email address in CC and keep this copy of email for yourself until the end of this semester. And title of subject is Buddhism 305 Week 1. The next week will be, will be Buddhism 305, week 2. This week, the assignment is, please write down your official name, last name, comma, followed by first name. Do not, do not swap the location of last and first name. Do not swap. Okay? Do not use your nickname when you submit the assignment. Sending me the email of your official name will be count your attendance of the first week of this course. The due of the first week assignment is April 11th, Sunday, midnight. Okay. This is all for the syllabus. From now on, we will study Buddhism in East Asia in terms of spreading Buddhism from India to East Asia.
in consideration of the spread of Buddhism from India into East Asia, first, let's look at the timeline of the development and decline of Buddhism in India. So Gautama Siddhartha Buddha, born and found Buddhism around this. 563 to 483 BC. So around this, around this time, the Buddha was born and found Buddhism. Then about 326 BC, around this region, the great Alexander invade India. So this is India, and great Alexander invade India. This map shows the northwest of the India, and then you can see this purple font. This purple color font indicates the cities founded by the great Alexander after invading and conquering India. So if you look at here, and he put his name on the city. So you can see Alexandria Escate, Alexandria in the Caucasus, Alexandria in Aracosia, Alexandria on the Indus, and here's Alexandria. So whenever he invade and conquer the city, he put his name. So these are the, the purple color, this dot indicate Great Alexander invade and conquer the India. And you can see here uh, Taxila. Here, Taxila. Taxila is in western Punjab and was an important city during Alexander's campaign in India. So here's Alexander's invasion to India. Then after that, Maurya Empire governed by Chandragupta established the India Empire around 322 BC. So Chandragupta established Maurya Empire. And the son of Chandragupta is Bindusara. And the son of King Bindusara was King Asoka. So King Asoka was grandson of Chandragupta. And this King Asoka was emperor at the beginning, but later he became a Buddhist monk and spread Buddhism around the 3rd century BC. So around 269-270 BC, that is around the 3rd century BC, Asoka spread Buddhism throughout India. From the death of King Asoka, then the next emperor is King Kanishka. Until King Kanishka, India was called Buddhist India, but this title became ceased to be so. When the Chinese pilgrim, whose name is Huaxiang, traveled in India in the early years of 4th AD, around this area, around this time, 4th century AD, Fashan, this Chinese pilgrim found Buddhism nearly everywhere in decay. Then the Hun located north to the India, H-U-N, the Hun invade India and destroy monastery and suppressed Buddhism in the 6th 
century AD. So already passed here. So 4th AD, Chinese pilgrim observed that Buddhism in decline. And 6th century AD, Hun invaded India. And the 7th century AD, there is another Chinese pilgrim named Xuanzang traveled in India and Xuanzang encountered many non-Buddhists in the early years of the 7th century. So during 700 up to 1200 AD, the Indian subcontinent was divided among numerous kingdoms throughout the first millennium until the formation of the Gupta Empire. Decline of Buddhism in the India was not a singular event. It was a centuries-long process. And in the 11th and 12th century AD, which is not appear in this map, Muslim invade India and this invasion, Muslim invasion, virtually extinguish Buddhism in the Indian subcontinent and in Central Asia. Sometimes I will introduce a timeline with BC AD and then BC is equal to B. C, E, same meaning. Also, A, D is equal to C, E, common era. B, C, E means before common era. So, B, C, E, same meaning of B, C, C, E, same meaning of A, D. So I told you just before, this is the timeline, summary of a timeline. So you can uh, read this slide and then go back to this map and then you can match uh, what's going on along the timeline. So Buddhism, here is Shakyamuni Buddha, born and found Buddhism. And then Buddhism flourished around King Asoka and then the Buddhism slowly decline decline there are several reasons why decline of buddhism occur in the india there is some invasion by other tribes or competition with the hinduism and also invasion by muslim there are several factors to cause the decline of buddhism in india we will study this later, maybe next week or the following week. Let's look at the map of India along the timeline. The left map shows this orange color, shows the region ruled by Chandragupta. Chandragupta is the grandfather of King Asoka. And this orange color region was ruled by Chandragupta and the first Indian empire was highly centralized and governed by an idea of exercising power impartially. Right map shows Asoka empire during 250 BC. A little bit expand from the Chandragupta's reign. So this, the northeast area is a little bit expanded. Asuka's empire reached at its greatest extent of Buddhism. If you look at this black triangle post, this black triangle post indicate the site of Asoka's rock and pillar edicts. 
In other words, King Asoka spread Buddhism throughout India. He constructed monastery and he also constructed pillar and also he inscribed edicts on the rock. King Asuka supported the construction of monasteries and missions to other countries. The Buddhist emperor Asoka promoted Buddhism and made Buddhism into a major religion in the Indian continent. Eventually, Buddhism declined, died out in India. But missionaries King Ashoka sent actually brought his teachings throughout Asia, causing Buddhism to survive and become a modern major religion. Let's study King Asoka a little bit more. Again, he is a grandson of Chandragupta. King Asoka gained control of all but southern tip of India through intense fighting. So, except this southern tip of India, the rest part of the Indian continent governed by King Asoka. Since he had many times better, so he is described as bloodthirsty, but at the same time, he carries compassion to others. Ultimately, he converted to Buddhism and spread Buddhism throughout India. King Asoka communicated his policies throughout his realms by inscribing edicts in natural stone formation and pillars. The ethics promoted Buddhist values and expressed his concerns to rule fairly, justly, and humanely. In the ethics, there is not a word about God or the soul, even not a word about Buddha or Buddhism. The statements are self-evident to all the subjects of the empire. Here are the examples of ethics inscribed on the rock by King Asoka. Some rock hold the ethics such as no animal may be slaughtered for sacrifice. Docility to parents is good. Liberality to friends, acquaintances, and relatives, and to Brahmins and recluse is good. Not to endure living beings is good. Economy in expenditure and avoiding dispute is good. Self-mastery, purity of heart, gratitude, and fidelity are always possible and excellent even for the man who is too poor to be able to give largely. In this way, King Asuka promotes Buddhist values and express his concerns to rule fairly, justly, and humanely. I mentioned that King Ashoka supported the construction of a monastery. So this is his first temple at Buddha Gaya named Sanchi. And left panel shows inside the Sanchi temple. And right panel shows the gate of Sanchi Sutupa. So this part. This part, the gate of Sanchi Stupa, appears here in detail.
Asuka communicated his policies throughout his realm by pillars that he ordered to be erected. And on the top of the pillar, the lion capital has been adopted as official national emblem. King Ashoka also sent missionaries across India to spread Buddhism. Therefore, paving the way for the spread of Buddhism into Asia. This upper panel showed the root of missionaries inside India. So the missionaries were sent from India to Sri Lanka. The lower panel showed the missionaries outside the India. So you can see here into China, even sometimes by sea it goes Southeast Asia. King Asoka's missionaries and their writings spread Buddhism throughout India and to East Asia and South Asia. There are two routes of overland to introduce Buddhism into China. So maritime Buddhism, we will consider that later. Here, you just think about land route. So here's India, and then one route is northern route. Here's Taklamakan Desert. So northern fringe of desert Taklamakan passing Kucha, Crusher, and Turfan. And south route is southern fringe of desert Taklamakan. So this route and passing Kotan and North Route and South Route merge here in Dunhuang. So we will study later where is the important Buddhist center in Southern Route and also where is important Buddhist center in Northern Route where we can find many Buddhist literatures. Also, once Buddhism spread out of India, the form of Buddhism is called Mahayana Buddhism. So, how's the difference between Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism? So, in the centuries following the Buddha's death, different viewpoints appear in the interpretation of his teachings. By the 1st century AD, two forms of Buddhism emerged. One is Theravada Buddhism, the other one is Mahayana Buddhism. Theravada Buddhism is the name given to the tradition that most closely follows the teachings and traditions established during the time of the Buddha and in the following centuries. It means teachings of the elders. Theravada Buddhism sometimes called Southern Buddhism because it is mainly practiced in Thailand, Cambodia, Burma, Laos, and Sri Lanka. Mahayana Buddhism during the 1st century AD as the teachings developed and spread a form of Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism emerged. Mahayana Buddhism means great beaker. 
In the Mahayana tradition, there is a belief in Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is beings who are on the path to becoming Buddha, but Bodhisattva chose to delay their final release from rebirth out of compassion to help all creatures. Mahayana Buddhism, that is practiced in China, Japan, and Korea, and Vietnam is often called Eastern Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism, that is mainly practiced in Tibet, Mongolia, Bhutan, part of China, and the Himalayan regions of Nepal and India is often called Northern Buddhism. So in this course, we will more focus on Eastern Buddhism, such as Mahayana Buddhism practiced in Korea, Japan, and China. Then let's think about when and how Mahayana Buddhism start to, to arise. It sounds like Theravada Buddhism is more like very closely almost the same of the Buddha's teaching. Then, what caused Mahayana Buddhism to arise? And when has Mahayana Buddhism start to begin? After 100 years after the Buddha's Parinibbana, Parinibbana means Buddha's death. So after 100 years after the Buddha's death, there is some monk called Bazi monk, modified minor rules. So some monk, group of monks called Bazi monks, they claim to modify some disciplines, 10 kinds of disciplines. There have been 273 rules for Piku monks, and there have been 311 rules for Pikuni nuns in Vinaya. Vinaya means discipline, rules, therefore, Monastics must keep this Vinaya. But Bazi monk claimed to modify some of these rules. Upon modifying minor 10 rules, senior monk called the second council because this modification has been regarded as a big issue with respect to modifying spirit of the Sangha. So it sounds like some split occur among the monastics. Let's look at what kind of minor rules. Ten minor rules Bajin monk claim to modify. First, carrying salt. Monastic not supposed to carry salt, but in India, on the hot climate, losing moisture by sweating require for salt to balance body physiology. So in terms of acidic and basic balance, so, some kind of taking salt is required. So, Vazi monk request, let's carry some salt. Second proposition is time for eating. They do not have a watch at the time. Therefore, how they can measure the time is they put the finger on the land and then they measure the length of shadow generated by finger. 
and then depending on the length of finger shadow, they determine, oh, you can eat, meal, you can lunch, or if the time passed noon, then you cannot eat meal. So, one seed eating was committed during the Buddha's period. Depending on the length of the finger shadow, the monastics cannot eat after 12. If monastic pass noon, then there is no meal provided at night. Because in early Buddhism, night meal was prohibited. So, if the monastic pass the noon, then the monastic cannot eat the rest of the day. So, a Vazi monk appeared that sometimes monastics can pass the noon. Then, couldn't it be flexible to have eating because there is no food at night? The other proposition is meal between religious monastery. The monk departed from one monastery after his first meal. But the second monastery is very far, so taking long journey and arrive at the second monastery when the second meal was passed. So in other words, when the monk arrived at the second monastery, the monastic passed the noon. Upon the late arrival at the second monastery, monk supposed to reject the second meal according to the Vinaya. But Vazi monk claimed that because of distance and also hot weather, it's very not easy to walk fast. So even though late arrival at the second meal, please give a permission to have a second meal because there is no night meal. Another proposition is practice uposada. Uposada is a kind of a group reciter of Vinaya rules. So monastics get together and recite Vinaya rules. Once monastics get together, it forms one big ideal Sangha. But Vazi monk suggests that we can divide one ideal Sangha into several groups because of a long commute. So, group of monks form regional Sangha rather than one big ideal Sangha. But still, small several regional Sangha can get together and recite Vinaya rules. Then, senior monk disagree with that because if one big ideal Sangha divided into several groups of Sangha, this could cause the division followed by the loss of the unity. And another proposition is, unless all monks were there, for example, ordination, transaction could not be done. So for ordination, all monks need to get together. But sometimes, some monks cannot come to the meeting due to punishment or some other things. Therefore, it's not very practical. So, Vazi monk suggests some other idea is in terms of more practical and based on efficiency. Vazi monk claim 10 proposition and the sixth proposition is customary habit. Teachers 
teacher does some practice, so do the same practice. Vazi monk disagree with that, and then the Buddha points to practice not in the teacher's way, but in right way. Therefore, Vazi monks do not want to simply follow teacher's practice. Another proposition is there's some arguing about the status of material, such as when milk is boiled, after boiling milk, it turns out to be curd. Is it okay to drink between neither milk nor curd? So, at night, monastic allowed to drink milk, but they should not eat something chewing. So, drink milk is okay. But in terms of a curd, you need to chew. That is not allowed. But when milk is boiling, then it turns out to be curd. So is it okay to drink in a mediate state between neither milk nor curd? So it's really minor things. And Vazi monks ask for the permission to be flexible to minor things. Another proposition is avoid to drink alcohol even for the medicinal purpose. Another proposition is robe without fringe, otherwise considered luxurious in terms of decoration. So when monastic wear robe, the edge of robe should not have a fringe because it considered be luxurious in terms of decoration. And acceptance of coin and gold and silver was prohibited. But Vazi monk asked for accepting these kind of things, uh, coin, gold and silver. Ten propositions of Vinaya rules proposed by Vazi monk were completely rejected by senior monk. So the group of Vazi monk is called Mahasangika. Since senior monk disagree Vazi monk ten proposition, Mahasangika, this Vazi monk decided that, okay, we think that just modifying these 10 minor rules will not disagree, will not obstruct the Buddha's teaching. If senior monk do not agree our proposition, then we will just go by our way. Therefore, Mahasangika, this Vazi monk group, Mahasangika, found their own way this is the beginning of Mahayana Buddhism. So, a beginning of a schism between Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism take place from the Bhaji monk proposed 10 minor rules. So, these 10 minor rules is very trivial, small things. But there is some split occur from Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism start to go astray from Theravada Buddhism. The beginning was a minor thing, but the more and more the gap is going to broaden. Therefore, nowadays, the characteristic of Theravada Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism in some sense quite different. So, around the 1st century AD, the spread of Buddhism from northern India along the trade route taken by merchants, monks, and travelers accelerated rapidly. 
to the north and east, Buddhism was transmitted to growing energy by the merchant who play a vital role in linking China with the Indus Valley. There were traveling merchant from the heart of Central Asia, classic middlemen whose own close-knit network and efficient use of credit left them ideally positioned to dominate long-distance trade. So this Silk Road is international highway. Along the highway, Buddhism can be transmitted. Also, to the south, in the Deccan Plateau, squares of cave temples were built with stupas deep into the Indian subcontinent. Upon transmitting Buddhism from India into East Asia, how Buddhism came to disappear from India? how Buddhism came to decline from the land of its birth, India. Some scholars contended that Buddhism never disappeared but simply changed form or was absorbed into Hindu practices. Buddhism displaced as Turkish invasions destroy holy site temples. About 1,200 Muslim forces destroy library of Nalanda and thousands of monks exiled. By the 7th century, Buddhism was declining rapidly. Theravada Buddhism nearly disappeared, while Mahayana Buddhism was absorbed into Hinduism and Islam. And modified form of Theravada Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism became more popular in China, Korea, and Japan. So let's think about the characteristic of a Theravada Buddhism might provide the reason why Buddhism become declined in Indian continent. If Theravada Buddhism transformed to Mahayana Buddhism in Indian continent, then Buddhism might not be disappear in India? Let's think about that later by studying the characteristic of Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism in detail. We will study that later. Before closing today's lecture, I like to introduce one school in India. The name is Nalanda University. The University of Nalanda has been built before the era of King Asoka. So before King Asoka, there was University of Nalanda. Probably it was monastery and later it became change into university. Nalanda's traditional history dates to the time of the Buddha. It's about 6th, 5th centuries BC. And here is the location of Nalanda. And uh, it looks like this, this building. And in Nalanda, Nargajuna, he is the Buddhist philosopher, or Nargajuna is called the second Buddha. And he lived during 2nd and 3rd century CE. 
and Nargarjuna study in Nalanda University. Also, I mentioned the Chinese pilgrim. His name is Xuanzang. He's very famous. We will study him. Also, Xuanzang stay and study in Nalanda for some time during the 7th century CE. So, here is the location of Nalanda. Still, the University of Nalanda is present in current era in India. So, you can visit Nalanda University. Okay, uh, today we briefly study about the spread of Buddhism from India into East Asia. Next time, we will study more detail about what could be the reason to cause spread of Buddhism from India to East Asia, and who can be the Indian patriot to transmit Buddhism to East Asia. Upon the end of this class, you submit assignment. This week assignment is really simple, easy. So you will send email, and also when you send email, include your email address, cc, and keep every email for yourself until the end of this semester. And title of subject is Buddhism 305, Bird 305, Week 1. You can write down Week 1 assignment. It's okay. Just Week 1 is okay. In the body of the main text, you write down your official name, right name, followed by first name. Please put comma between last name and first name. Do not swap the position between last and first name. Last name must come before first name. Do not use nickname when you submit the assignment. Sending me the email of your official name will be count your attendance of the first week of this course. The due of week one assignment is April 11th, Sunday midnight. So this is the exact example of your week one assignment. So this is email, CC, title of subject, and you write down my name is last name, comma, first name. It must be official name so that I can generate roster based on your official last name and first name. Okay, so please send this assignment to me and you will have next week lab video next Monday. Okay, this is the end of today's lecture. Thank you. Bye now.